can complicate a free lunch, and that's what I did. So this is a story I can tell off the top of my head. But I chose to try to get precisionly matched music to go with it. So I spent about 10 hours getting these clips just exactly right. And, um, So this is, yeah, like, uh, and it's about the day that I bought this shirt, which was October 15th, 1983. <laughs> okay. I had heard a few Grateful Dead songs on the radio before I went off to college, like Friend of the Devil, Ripple. I kind of thought of them as a country band. I got to school and it took a while to make any friends. One night I wore my Yukon Jack t-shirt to dinner and some guys asked me if I liked Yukon Jack. Yukon was a kind of overproof liquor that was popular at my high school. I had never actually tried it. They said, oh yeah. We got to talking about partying and they invited me to their dorm for a hazer later on. Now hazer was when a bunch of people would chip in a dollar each to buy a bag of weed. The whole thing would be rolled up and passed around until it was finished, and so were you. <laughs> I got there and I met a bunch of the kind of people that I went to college to meet. The joints started going around the room, and I was pointed out that we needed to hear some music. My surprise came when someone suggested that if we were getting stoned, we needed to listen to The Grateful Dead. The Grateful Dead? A country band? <laughs> I learned that the dead were considered to be the ultimate underground psychedelic band. Who would have guessed? I fell in with some people who liked to party the way I did and liked the kind of music I liked, and I started listening to the dead. Within a few months I was convinced, and by spring I was at my first dead show. Two years later I was heading from Springfield to Hartford with my fraternity brothers, Sander and Jake, for my fifth show. I had been gradually learning about the culture of the deadheads. I had a few t-shirts, some blue black tapes, and I'd been to a few shows, but I still wasn't sure if I qualified as a real deadhead. <laughs> deadheads went to extraordinary lengths to make it to every show possible. I had never quit my job or just across the country, but I was falling into the lifestyle. We got to Hartford early and spotted an empty plot, an empty plot that seemed like it would be a good place to park for free. Then we were off to sell the extra ticket I had. Outside the Civic Center, I met a head with a single finger in the air, indicating he was looking for one ticket. He had a heavy New York accent and kept arguing the price with me, telling me, Don't be a rug rat. <laughs> we settled on a deal, and then he asked if we had seen him in New York City last week. No. Well, they played St. Stephen. <laughs> St. Stephen, really? I never heard that. I always wanted to hear that. It's no wonder you haven't. They haven't played it in four years. <laughs> He implied we'd never be cool enough to see it, and I didn't think too much more about it. <laughs> By this time, the dead had settled into a show pattern where they played a set of shorter songs, took a break, then played a second set featuring longer songs, a drum solo, and then a period of highly improvised, trippy space music. We got inside and found some seats, and the show started with Feel Like a Stranger. Bobby Weir was pointing to the crowd every time he'd say, it's going to be a long, long, crazy, crazy night. And one time, I swear, he pointed right at us. <laughs> the show was hot, and we were digging it. And like a lot of other people, I would write down the songs that, so that I could go home with a set list for the show. Real deadheads prided themselves on being able to recognize an incoming song on just the slightest tense found in the, the noodling between songs. The space was, was 10 to 20 minutes of noodling that would set up the last few songs of the night. Three quarters of the way through a very hot show, space was proceeding along with Jerry running up and down on various scales, but with some billion energy of each time. Several times it came to a near crescendo, only to calm down again. Now if there was one song clue that was unequivocal, it came from two notes, F sharp, F sharp. That's all you really needed to hear. You were in the know. If you weren't, the following run of notes would confirm St. Stephen. Here 
Apparently the crowd was aware of the rarity of what we were witnessing too. <laughs> the first two notes I had, it, and on the tape you can hear many others did as well. With the next riff, the crowd's elation came on so strong that the person who recorded the first two play copy I got had to turn their levels way down to keep their tape from being overmapped. I still feel the elation today of that, thinking back to that show, or when I was in the blue light. They played St. Stephen three times in October of 1983, and they never played it again. I got the tapes for all three shows, and Hartford was the best. After a few more songs that gradually wound the energy back down into an encore of Rotown Palace, we left the building satisfied. On the way back to the lot, we saw Mr. Rugrat, and I called out to him, Hey! St. Stephen! St. Stephen! They played it! But he didn't seem impressed. I think he would rather have had it that nobody ever saw the song again. A verse type, for sure. <laughs> we got back to the lot, but my car wasn't there. The real start of our long, long, crazy, crazy night, and my first extraordinary win. But that's another story for the Stephen. <laughs> 